Hi, my name is Connie Susan Trella, uh, and I've been a CPO instructor now for 34 years. So this is this is my love is to be able to come to the World Aquatic Health Conference. Another love of mine is energy efficiency, conservation, and sustainability. So I am actually a groupie for these two guys. <laughs> I go everywhere they are, wherever they're speaking, because I always learn so much. And it gives me great pleasure this morning to introduce Mike Fowler, who is the uh, commercial marketing manager. And before I go any further, if you hear a little noise in the back, we have a wonderful friend of mine from Ukraine who has an interpreter. So since he doesn't speak English, we are uh, allowing him. So if you hear a little murmur, just be blessed that we, he came all this way, okay? Now, as I said, I'm a groupie. Uh, Jeff is my king of green, and I labeled him that years and years ago. Um, he is the foremost expert when it comes to energy initi initiatives in our industry. Connie's the queen of green. <laughs> and uh, I could, I've got this long list, um, but I just have to say that um, I cherish all of the work that he and Pentair have done over the last several years or the last 10 years and all the initiatives that has given so much and added so much to our industry. So I, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike and to Jeff. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Help me down, I'm old. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming in today. We appreciate your time and uh, we wanna thank the uh, National Swimming Pool Foundation uh, for allowing us to be part of this and just uh, just uh, a, a chance we have to be part of this conference now. I think this is probably our least eighth or ninth year we've been involved and being able to help be a sponsor uh, and being taken advantage of being able to, to see such a great audience and, and great crowd of the attendees here. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today, and actually I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff, he's gonna do most of the presentation, um, is, is over the last few years, everybody knows in this room, that energy efficiency and, 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 and conservation has been a key thing, not only in, in households and in all other parts of uh, industrial, but obviously it's hit the aquatics industry. And uh, Pentair, we're proud as, as members of Pentair um, that we've made a commitment to that, not just in our aquatics division, but across the other parts of Pentair that we're not involved with, have made a real commitment to energy conservation and, and savings and across the product lines, along with several other manufacturers in our industry. So it's good to see that everybody's been on, on trying to get on board here and do this because it's, it's a big opportunity. It's a big opportunity for end users, for facilities, uh, as they go in and, and with the tight budgets and everything is with the economy as it comes and goes, uh, to look at these energy opportunities and what, what things are out there to take advantage of that, that not only will improve the quality of what's out there in the performance of your equipment or, or, or locations, but also you know, put some money back in your budget to use for other things as well. So um, we're, we're happy to be here today and hopefully this is gonna be a great presentation, I'm sure it will, with, uh, with Jeff and uh, what he's gonna share with you today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Jeff Farlow and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks again for being part of it. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm from North Carolina, so I have a little bit of a southern draw. You'll adjust to it, I'm sure, before the end of this, if, um, if you haven't already. Uh, I've also had probably three cups of coffee this morning, so I'm looking about 20 minutes into the future right now. My, my, my tongue doesn't always catch up with, with my vision looking out there, so bear with me. If I, if I misspeak, call me on it, okay? <laughs> All right. So um, what we're really trying to talk about today is our new um, utility industry that is emerging and progressing at a tremendous rate right now. And um, our pool industry has the opportunity to take advantage of some of the incentives um, that are offered, but um, it's going to take a different way for us to look at how we filter pools, I think, to really capitalize on, on the benefit. So what I'm going to really try to talk about today is some, some terminology, just energy 101, so we can speak the same language on some simple energy terms, and then just a little bit on the commercial pool market and it's the size of, of the market, and then spend most of the time talking about the utility industry and how it's changing, and you'll see how that landscape is, 
is just rapidly growing and then I try to bring that together so how we can play a role in that and, and take advantage of some of the benefits that's going to be offered to, to um, uh, companies and technologies that can um, that are smart. We're just really this is really about a smart grid opportunity. So having uh, appliances that can speak uh, electronically with the utility industry and with other aggregators is going to be a real benefit going forward. I've also got some case studies to talk about. Um, so let me just start just to whet your appetite a little bit. Uh, recently did a, um, a retrofit project for the city of San Antonio. They have 26 city-owned pools, uh, and we were just looking at uh, retrofitting these pools to add variable speed drives to their existing pumps. The uh, city spent $137,000 for this retrofit. That actually, of the 26 pools, 22 of them went through a retrofit. Uh, they received annual savings of $63,000. The utility gave them $87,000 in rebates to offset that, that cost, um, a nine-month payback. That's, that's a really good use of that city's resources to be able to invest in this technology. And with zero negative impact on water quality. Actually, water quality was improved in many of the pools as a result of this. Um, so a pretty, pretty healthy return on investment for the city. So let's look at energy. Energy 101. Um, these are two terms that, because I'm going to reference these terms and the difference between them throughout this. So I want you to just grasp this for a second and understand the, the difference between these two. And that's KW and KWH, or kilowatts and kilowatt hours. They're related but, but distinctly different. So KW is an instantaneous value. It's the rate at which you're pulling energy off the grid or the rate at which an appliance is, is consuming power. It's called power. Um, then we have kilowatt hours, which is the quantity of energy that's being consumed over, over time. So think of it like uh, the KW would be like looking at your speedometer. If you're driving 60 miles an hour, that's an instantaneous value. You're doing it right now. Um, and then the kilowatt hours would be looking at your odometer, measuring how many miles you've driven. If you're in a car from Hertz, um, they may charge you so much a day and so many cents per mile. They don't charge you so many cents per mile per hour. Right? They don't care if you drove it at 100 miles an hour or at 10 miles an hour. They're charging you by the mile. So in the same way, the kilowatt hour is the quantity of energy that's being used, and that's, how, that's, that's what impacts your power bills, is the kilowatt hours. So, um, and if we know kilowatt hours, um, we can really easily and accurately translate that into cost of operation. So excuse me, we have a, a KW. This is a case where the average one horsepower, one and a half horsepower pump draws about two kilowatts or 2,000 watts of, of power. If you run it eight hours a day, multiply those, that's 16 kilowatt hours of day for that energy use. And if the utility is charging you, let's say, 12 and a half cents per kilowatt hour, then you can say with, with, the, with certainty that that appliance is costing $2 a day to operate. So that's sort of the basis of any energy audit or any energy efficiency retrofit. So KW and KWH. Power is KW and energy is KWH. Uh, I think the national average is about 12 cents a kilowatt hour, 13 cents a kilowatt hour. That's one that varies. The, he was asking about the um, kilowatt hour charge. Um, I had 12 and a half cents as just sort of a national average. In California, um, you've got tiered structures. You may be paying 30 cents, 38 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, Versus in North Carolina, we pay about nine cents a kilowatt hour. And it's difference, it's difference, the difference between commercial and residential. Um, and that's, this is one of the big things that's changing, is that the price that you pay for electricity is going to change throughout the day. Because the cost to the utility, it costs them a lot more to generate power at certain times of the day, and they're going to start passing that cost on. So we're going to see widely uh, impacted um, kilowatt hour rates as a result of this new smart grid. So uh, just to refresh you, you've probably heard about this before, but I at least feel obligated to mention it, and that's the pump affinity law. If we're doing energy savings or demand reduction through variable speed technology, it relies on this concept called the affinity law, and it's simply a law of physics that applies to any centrifugal pump or centrifugal fan, and it just says that there's a relationship between the speed that that impeller or that fan um, blade is, is rotating 
And then um, there's just a, a direct relationship between the speed and the flow, it, between the speed and the pressure squared, and then the power cubed. And to try to put that in some terms, if we have an example where we have a pump running at 3,000 RPM, and we reduce its speed in half, we go to 1,500 RPM, well, for half the speed, we get about half the flow rate. They're directly proportional. But for half the speed, we look at one half times one half because it's a squared function. It only produces about one fourth of the pressure at that half speed. But if we look at power, because it's a cubic function, one half times one half times one half, it only uses one eighth of the power to give you half the flow. So the power is plummeting with even a modest reduction in, in your speed and modest reduction in your, in your flow rates. If we because it is a law of physics, it works both ways. If we're in a situation, let's say a fountain, where we really want to shoot the water up, um, and, and we, we put a variable speed drive on it, we say, let's double the flow rate to really get some, some aggressive, some good visual bang with this. Well, um, if we go half speed, that's one eighth. If we double the speed, we end up using eight times the amount of energy. Okay, so that cubic function can work both ways. So here's just another, another way to look at power. Um, so this is our, our power curve, this is the percent speed, and this is the percent energy consumption. So at 100% speed, we have 100% energy consumption. For just a 20% reduction in our speed, 80% speed, we have cut the, the power, the, actually this power, power consumption to half. For a 20% reduction, for a 50% reduction in speed and flow, we've gone to only 20% of the power consumption. So drastic impact as we start to slow things down, even a little bit. Even a 10% reduction is a 25% energy saving. So let's look at the, the performance parameter that Energy Star uses to determine how energy efficient a product is. And so um, as we look at regulation, let me talk about um, EPA and, and Department of Energy. So Environmental Protection Agency runs the voluntary standards program called Energy Star and they're tasked with identifying the top 20% performing products in the marketplace. Um, it is voluntary. Uh, it, we just launched this in about 2013. It took five years to develop an Energy Star program for, for pool pumps. The, um, if we look at that 20% that line, what we find is most any multi-speed pump, two-speed or variable speed, is capable of meeting that standard. And as of right now, there's only one pump in the industry that's a single speed that can meet that standard. It's coincidence, but that just happens to be where they, where they do the line. So that's EPA. Now, we just embarked uh, last week on a process where the Department of Energy is now going to federally regulate minimum efficiency standards for, for pool pumps. So they're basically looking at the top 20% gets a voluntary Energy Star mark. The bottom 20% are going to be eliminated from the market no longer legal to import or manufacture for sale those products in the U.S. So that process looks probably is going to be complete in the spring of 2016, anywhere from three years to five years for manufacturers to comply. A large commercial pumps are already subject to a newly released standard. This one is really dedicated purpose pool pumps, uh, pumps that have a basket strainer on them. So two different uh, things, voluntary but through EPA and then federally mandated through DOE. In the same way, the only other uh, product that we have in the industry that's federally regulated are pool heaters. So there are minimum efficiency standards for gas pool heaters. And so this is falling under that same, that same regulation. So energy factor is the term that we use to determine how efficiently a, a pump operates. And energy factor just represents how much work you do per unit of energy consumed. In the same way we look at an automobile and we can drive so many miles, that's the work that we're doing, and consume so much energy. That's the gallons of fuel. So it's work divided by energy. If we look at a pump, um, it's how many gallons can you pump per kilowatt hour of energy consumed. So same, same ratio, same kind of um, measure of how efficient um, it can be. Now I like to think the, the true spec is gallons per watt hour. But I like to just multiply numerator, denominator by 1,000, and then we have how many thousands of gallons per kilowatt hour. Okay, it sort of puts it in pool terms. We think about thousands of gallons. In energy, we think about kilowatt hours. So that's how I like to look at the term. Now, what impact does that have? Here's, here's sort of a, uh, a table of how efficient basic products are. If we look at the Energy Star database, 
and some of the other databases of pump performance. The um, average single speed pump, energy efficient single speed pump, can pump somewhere between 2,000, um, around 2,000, from 1,000 to 2,500 gallons of water and only use one kilowatt hour of energy to do that. Um, in order to meet the Energy Star spec, you've got to pump at least 3,800 gallons of water while only consuming one kilowatt hour of energy. Um, most two-speed pumps on their low-speed setting, in the, in somewhere in the 4,000 to 6,000 gallons of water pumped per kilowatt hour. The variable speed technology is capable of in the 12,000 to 30,000 gallons of water pumped per kilowatt hour. So tremendous energy savings without impacts on, on our water quality. That's the thing I want to keep stressing throughout this. So um, once again, almost all two speeds and variable speeds meet the energy star requirement, all right? Now let's look, just a real quick glimpse, glimpse of our um, commercial pool market. This is from PK Data. They just released a new commercial report about two weeks ago. So we have about 322,000 um, commercial pools. That's about 70 billion gallons of treated water for the commercial pool industry. And we have it segregated here in the different size pools. And then we also across these different segments. So once again, that's, that's available through PK Data's new, new report. So a lot of pools, a lot of water. 322,000 commercial pools with all those running their pumps at the same time of day, which most of our commercial pools are running uh, during the hot time of day when utility companies are at their point where their, their grid is stressed and they can produce about all the, all the energy they can produce. That's 4,000 megawatt megawatts of energy, instantaneous value, 4,000 megawatts of power being consumed on the grid by all these pools. That's equivalent to eight medium-sized power plants. A 500 megawatt coal-fired power plant, it's taken eight, eight of those nationally dedicated just to keeping our water clean. So a huge impact our industry's having nationwide. That's the cost equivalent of probably two um, nuclear power plants. But I think of the eight coal-fired plant, plants that could be taken or, or impacted. And our grid is becoming much more stressed. So, the other way. So let's look at the utility sector for a second and how it's, how it's changing. So once again, rapid, rapid change. Um, new advanced technology is being implemented. Um, as we've allowed for economic growth and we promote economic growth and we want economic growth, um, building a new power plant is, not, is a very politically charged thing. Nobody wants a new power plant in their backyard. Okay, so we have very limited and constrained resources that allow for the, all this economic growth. That's why energy efficiency is so important. We want, to, we want to allow for economic growth, but we really need to do it with sort of our existing infrastructure, which is aged and it's constrained. Um, another thing utilities are going through is some competition. Typically they've been monopolies. Now they're opening it up, so they actually have to compete for their service now. So another thing that's, that's really changing the utility industry. Now, what kind of things are changing it? We've got new technology. People can control their lights in their homes with, with iPad apps, iPhone apps. Um, utilities are going to what's called real-time pricing. Um, they may be times of the day where they're having to pay $40 for one kilowatt hour of energy, but they can only sell it for 11 cents. So you can see how that, um, financial model is not sustainable. And that's becoming more and more the reality for the utility company. So they're having to learn how to pass that cost on to consumers so they can answer to their stockholders. And that's where real-time pricing is something that we're going to be faced with. So consumers can decide at what point, if, if electricity gets this high, I want, I want my house to do something. I want to make sure my refrigerator doesn't go into a defrost mode. I want to make sure that I adjust my thermostat at least a couple of degrees to give me some relief while that, while that energy is so high. And they also have the ability to predict um, at, at 4 o'clock this afternoon, your rates are going to drop 
from 40 cents a kilowatt hour down to four because the utility has the capacity at that point. And so you're going to be able to schedule, I want to do my defrosting or my clothes washing at that time when my, when my electricity rates are really low. Now we already have time of use rates in some places where the morning is cheap, the night it's, um, I mean night it's cheap, morning it's expensive, but we're looking at something much more dynamic and much more real time than anything that we've experienced right now. Um, rebates, utilities are, they're incented. You know, it's, it's a weird financial model where your business is to make and sell energy and yet you're going to pay somebody money to use less of what it is that you're making and selling. Right, that's not a real sustainable business model, but when they can avoid the cost of having to build a new power plant, it becomes very attractive to say, please use a little less of this. I want to allow for economic growth and I don't want to have to build that new power plant. So the, the financial folks, can, they call that avoided cost. They can now take credit for the money that they didn't have to spend to build the power plant and that helps fund these incentives. So financially it works. And then there's this thing called demand response. And this is where the smart appliances of the smart grid are really starting to, to interplay. Where the utility at certain times of the day, when they reach that critical point, they can't buy any more power on the open, on the open market, they can't generate any more, their options are just brownouts. Take a section of the grid, and it happened in San Diego, I think, two weeks ago. They just had to say, you know, for you 100,000 customers, you're going to have to do without right now. And there's serious legal implications. They're required by law to, to provide power. There's, um, you know, health, medical reasons why they are they're required to do it, but they simply don't have the capacity. So for the utility to be able to pick appliances and say, give me a little re relief right now, like the new Nest thermostats, they can go talk to a Nest thermostat and say, please just change your thermostat setting by two degrees. And what that two degrees does, it just shuts off the air conditioner long enough, maybe 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, um, and to give, the, to give the, some relief on the grid. And then they can go to another bank of thermostats. Those come back on, so people don't want their home to heat up by 10 degrees. Um, and then they go to another bank of thermostats and say, I need it from you now, and I need it from you now. And to have that precise, precision-like surgical control of different appliances and variable speed pumps is a, is a great one for this, especially in the residential application. Who cares if their pump is slowing down for a little bit in the middle of the day? Nobody would even know it. So it's very attractive for a utility company to target a pool pump. Uh, Energy Star has two products now where they have actually developed a standardized methodology for how the product should respond if the utility asks for help, and that's pool pumps and refrigerators. And all a can, refrigerator can really do is maybe set, adjust the set point, and if it's in a defrost mode, say hold off your defrost for a little while, because defrost is an energy intensive process. For pool pumps, I need you to slow down a little bit, I need a little bit of relief, or I have an emergency situation, I need you to slow down a lot or shut off. Not appropriate for, for commercial applications. And there's cases now where they may need it to speed up. They may need to pump more water. And that has to do with this um, volatile generation we have now. So, all this renewable generation, you know, that's, that's coming onto the grid. We have solar, we have wind, biomass, geothermal, hydro, harnessing um, energy out of the waves. All of these vary significantly with time. You don't turn the, um, the sun on in the morning and it stays stable all day long. There's cloud cover, it's going all over the place. Wind gusts come through a place and all these, gener all these wind generators speed up. Energy is not really stored. Traditionally, it's not. In the new grid, they actually do have little ways of storing energy, but typically it's not stored. What do you do with all that excess energy? How about taking a pool pump and say, I need you to speed up a little bit, suck a little more energy, and we'll give it to you for free. It's just easier for us to give you that power for free than it is to try to do something else with it. You really can't do anything else with it. Now, Tesla, you've probably heard of, they make cars, but really Tesla's a battery company. They just happen to build cars because it's a place they use a battery. And they're um, investing huge, big time, in the utility scale storage market, where there is a mechanism now when you get that ex ex excess capacity to be able to dump it in a big battery pack and then pull it back out. So these are all competing technologies out there. So here's sort of the, the picture, the landscape of what the old type utility system looked like in our new one. The traditional utility model was just centralized power generation. Big, large power plants spewing exhaust or steam from nuclear, and then they go through a huge transmission, the big, big, high metal towers, our transmission 
system. And then they go to these um, transformer stations where the voltages drop down and it becomes part of the distribution system rather than transmission system where it's fed to houses and industries, commercial buildings, factories, commercial swimming pools. So that's the old model. This is what our new model's look, looking like. Very different. So we still have some centralized power sources, but we've got local PV, solar energy. We've got um, combined heat and power. We've got wind power that are all feeding into this grid. We still have homes that are using it, buildings that are using it. And then we have these um, storage places. We're, and they're looking at, so now they're referring to as nodes. In this little node, we've got so much renewable, we've got so much storage, we're feeding so much um, of the traditional um, centralized power. So it's changing rapidly right now. And we need to figure out how to be able to play in this, this new space. And there's value for us in being able to accommodate ourselves to play in that, in that new market. So I was talking about the different um, the specs, Energy Star, de demand response. So remember, demand is like KW. It's that instantaneous value. Not so much concerned about the quantity of your energy, but at this moment right now, what can you do to change things? So Energy Star says type 1, slow down. Type 2, really slow down. Or type 3, speed up. Um, these price-based signals, you can have your equipment um, set up to respond to whatever your, your uh, real-time pricing is. And this is an example of, the, of a peak curve throughout the day. So the, um, the, the red line indicates throughout this utilities um, distribution system how much power is being sucked off the grid. And it's typically different utilities, different regions have different peak times, but often from noon to 6 p.m. is a real common peak time. And then this actually represents how much relief would be on the grid just in this particular utility, just from a pool pumps being able to slow down a little bit. So it gives them a lot of extra capacity. Now, let's look at this, um, what I'm calling interdependence that we have. So I mentioned earlier, 32, uh, 322,000 commercial pools, four megawatt hours, excuse me, four megawatts. A 20% reduction in speed for one hour would give us the, free up the capacity of four power plants. Four power plants, if we could, as an industry, could do that collectively. Not realistic, but just to give you an idea of the impact that could be, that could be had. Four plants, just a 20% reduction in flow rates. 50% reduction for an hour frees up seven of the eight that we're, that we're hogging right now. We've been building systems that are just over-pumped. They don't need to. We establish required flow rates, and yet they're designed with, you know, 50% more than that. Much, much more than is needed because we need to have some backup. There's some CYA in there. There's, there's all different reasons, some very legitimate, but we don't always need to be over pumping. And this kind of technology gives us that ability to right size it for the application, for the loading on the filter, for the changing in, in head loss in the system. It can be right sized. I just talked about that one. So being able to utilize this, this new technology um, we need to be thinking of how this win-win opportunity. There's a lot of value to a utility company to be able to implement some of these control strategies. There's a lot of value to our industry to be able to accommodate that. They offer huge incentives to um, be able to take control. And it's, you're not like giving up control, but you're, you're, there's definitely limits. You can set limits. This is what I can tolerate. And then you set the system up so that it doesn't exceed what your tolerance level is for being able to reduce flow rate. So let's look, if we've got a six hour turn and for 30 minutes in that six hours, if our flow rate drops 20% below that magic six hour turnover flow rate, is that really gonna impact the water quality for 30 minutes within a six hour turn? Pro probably not in the scheme of things for 30 minutes. And so as we look at what our requirements are um, and these minimum flow rates based on the calculation, you know, start thinking about ways that we can still get all we need accomplished 
Maybe we reduce flow rate for 30 minutes, and then for the next hour, we speed it up. So we still get a six hour turn in six hours. We just don't, we've allowed ourselves to drop below that threshold just for a short duration, okay? So just a new way of thinking about it so that we can accommodate this new grid. So here's, I'm gonna finish off with some, some case studies. How are we doing on time? Okay, all right. So I just wanna to touch on these. This, um, the city of San Antonio, which I referenced earlier, is, is a huge one. So, um, I, and I just want to wrap your appetite. This is brand new. Uh, it's really not even been released yet, but I want to at least introduce you to it. There will be many more topics on this particular um, project because it was, it was so impactful and it really took coordination with a lot of different entities to pull it off successfully. A lot of utilities have tried this and failed at it. Um, I read a report recently from a utility that, where they took some commercial pools, they put drives in and stepped back and they said, let's see what savings we can get. There were no savings because they didn't offer any training. They didn't educate the uh, operators what to do, what, how to press buttons. And they said, well, we're just not ready for, to implement this kind of technology yet. It's not sustainable in the market. It's like, well, that's how you ran your study. You just stuck it out there to see what would happen. That's not a program for success. This was, this was designed from the beginning. So the city of San Antonio, they were formed in 2011. They got $6 million of seed money from the stimulus funds. And um, they spend about 33 million a year on, on energy use for the city. The pools accounted for $320,000 per year in their energy use, 1% um, of, the, of the city's budget. They have 26 pools ranging in a wide, wide range of sizes. Um, only 22 of these turned out to be good candidates for retrofit. Um, about six million gallons of water. And what really sparked this interest was this document that was written by, by Department of Energy. Um, there's, did I put the link on here? I don't have the link for, for this. I can get you the link for, to download this. But this was published by the Department of Energy. They have a whole series of how to do in um, energy efficiency improvements to buildings. And they evaluated, um, contracted with this energy professional to write how to swap out a single speed pump with a variable speed pump for energy savings. And I've had many utilities tell me when I've shared this document with them, the single most useful document in them understanding the concept behind variable speed pumping for swimmer pools. So a really worthwhile document. I've got a couple with me, a few, that I can hand out if anybody's interested, but I can also give you a link for how to, how to get that. It's available for download online. So the project plan, really what this um, project was about was taking um, existing pumps, outfitting them with variable speed drives, installing flow meters. So there was a digital feedback to every one of these. So every pool was customized and programmed to its required flow rate. And then um, that was, the signal was fed back to the drive, so the drive, regardless of how loaded the filter was, the drive, uh, the, the flow sensor was given feedback to the drive, so it maintained the speed needed to establish that flow rate. So there was never a case where it was no longer meeting it. Here we are designed, designing a system to meet that. And those, those together resulted in, in the savings we talked about. So the different phases of the project, we did a pretty extensive um, audit, just analyzing the data and the, uh, and the opportunity. We actually, it took us two and a half weeks to do the energy audit on all of these 26 pools. We were drilling pipes, um, tapping uh, pressure gauges, measuring total TDH on the systems. We were using backup flow sensors, backup pressure sensors. We were measuring um, watts, amps, volts on every phase, every line for every appliance. I mean, it, it took you know two or three hours just to do an audit on, on a single pool, on a, on a good day, it took that. Um, but we had all the support from the health department, all the support from the city officials, all the support from the well, pool maintenance staff, um, all the support from the sustainability office in advance, all that was planned. So we, that's when we came out with the retrofit plan 
um, performed the implementation, then went back and did an audit after the fact. How effective were we at, at accomplishing these savings goals? And then the final report, which is like, I'm not sure if it's actually released for public use yet, but I wanted to at least share this with you. See again? <laughs> so it, it will be released soon. I think it's, um, it's undergoing some final, final peer reviews right now. So as I mentioned, we measured um, electrical information on the application, the hydraulic implications, the hydraulic parameters. Um, for the facilities, looked at everything, looked at the controls, the valves. We found um, filters that hadn't been backwashed in years. They were, um, they were backwashing, and they were backwashing, but a valve stuck, and they couldn't understand why that water got cloudy every single day. And so through this process of measuring pressures and, and looking at the system, well, that backwash valve is broken and been broken for years. And when we finally got the valve fixed, the sand bed was so packed that it couldn't, it couldn't be backwashed. It was like a brick in there. So I actually had to go in there and, and it was, so there were benefits that came out of this beyond just energy. There are actually um, whirlpools that end up with cleaner water as a result of it. Everything was documented with photographs. Um, so this was one quote that I wanted to share with you that came. I'm not going to read that to you. but So, I mean, that's the key. We can never, you can never save energy at the um, impact or at the expense of cleanliness and sanitation. But there is room to save energy and still maintain that. So here's a little more detail. I gave you the highlights early on, $137,000 investment. Um, that was a five-year ROI of 530%. Where else can you invest money and get that kind of ROI? I mean, Wall Street's not going to do it for you. And even for us pool owners with pools in our backyard, that's, that's a good use of your cash. Um, the demand. Whoops, 151 kW of demand reduction. That's why it was so attractive to the utility. $87,000 the utility gave me in rebates. And then for the tree huggers, we have gas emissions of, what, a million pounds of greenhouse gas emissions that were avoided. EPA cares about that. They really, you know, that's really tooting their horn. So eight of the pools had a six to 10 month payback without even any rebates applied to them. So, um, but the whole project resulted in an eight, in the whole 137,000 spent resulted in a, like an eight month payback. Here's another um, case study where um, Southern Cal Edison, they run a multifamily program. This is just a good for HOAs and, and multifamily pools where they actually, they, they have a, a they contract the purchase and the installation of pumps, and they will actually, for a multifamily application, they will buy the pump and have it installed for you, free of charge. The property owner is required to pay the permit, and after that, everything is covered. And they've had 520 installs in the last two years. They save about one kW per install, about 7,000 kilowatt hours per year. The average residential home uses about 11,000 kilowatt hours a year. So that's over half of, the, of a typical home's energy use in a year was saved per, per one pool. And what, that was requiring them to slow, slow it down when the pool was closed at night, slowing down. So the key concepts that I'm really trying to pull out of this, and this is sort of in, in closing here, is uh, you know, really I'm just trying to introduce the concept. I'm not expecting anybody to walk away from here ready to implement anything, but I'm trying to plant a seed with us that we are working um, and interfacing our industry in an extremely um, volatile utility market that's, that's going to be changing and we can benefit from it rather than try to fight it. Um, if we just sort of change the way we look at things, just a little bit. I'm not talking about a wholesale shift in things, just, just a little bit. Being able to accommodate some of this, it really gets us some win-win. So training, I want to point out that um, Training is, is key to this. We can't just throw new technology in there and step back and say, well, this, I can't wait for all these savings to happen. That's, it's just, it typically doesn't work that way. It's not the norm. 
So any, any program that's going to result in retrofits that take advantage of this energy savings, you've got to be able to offer training to all the stakeholders to be able to benefit from that. So one of the, one of the key concepts. So any, any questions on this? It's been real quiet. <laughs> Yes. How long, how long is the star rising? And assuming you might say two plus for the sound giant the uh, inlet outlet and uh, uh, moving different quantities of water mm -hmm. and there's energy why is there less of it and more of it? How do you measure the star How do you calculate the So um the first question regarding when it started, it launched in February of 2013. That's when the first, that's when the program started. February of 2013 is when Energy Star started, yeah. So it's relatively new, one of the newest um, product categories in the Energy Star portfolio. And regarding the um, comparing different pumps doing different work, um, let's look at an automobile where when, when we rate automobiles with their miles per gallon, we give it a city rating and a highway rating. And in order to be able to compare a Honda to a Toyota to a Prius, we, um, the, the Department of Transportation gives us standardized conditions. If you drive the car like this, under these conditions, through this terrain, what is going to be your miles per gallon for the city? And then they give us different conditions for the highway. Well, in the same way, the um, EPA has given us standardized conditions. Yeah, so each manufacturer that produces the product has to test it to these standardized conditions, like a, a, a two inch, a pool plumbed in two inches with a, with a cartridge filter, maybe one of them, and they give us these, these different conditions, but they're all standardized no matter where you're testing it. If you set the, uh, the test rig up like that, then you'll, you'll produce comparable results. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the figures there. Uh, what percent, percentage of, let's say, in terms of the funding rate, what percentage of the pools are public and what percentage of pools are backyard pools? We have 322,000 commercial, 322, commercial pools in the United States, and we have 5.5 million residential pools. So Is that? Well, they're smaller. They're, they use much smaller horsepower pumps than our typical commercial poles. There is, yes. Um, so uh, the residential... Well, the, the, pump, uh, the pump efficiency, you're right, in that as you make a product more efficient, um, that does increase its... It's, it's operating efficiency, but any improvements that you make in pump efficiency pale in comparison to the savings that are available by slowing it down. Because of that cubic function, uh, slowing it down a little bit reduces your power demand by a huge amount. And so that's going to um, dwarf any, any savings in energy efficient improvements. So they do uh, new technology, variable speed drives with permanent magnet motors and things like that. They do, they complement the savings that you get, but they're not going to offset any. Correct. 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 Correct, yeah. Well, um, I mean, you're right. The efficiency does have an impact. It really does. But in the, in, and by l raising the bar and eliminating poor performing products, that will have an impact. It really will. But what that will not address is the utility and the smart grid and the, and the need to right size. I mean, we don't want to be throttling valves to, 
to get our flow rates. That is, a, it's a poor, poor, poor way to do it. Very energy intensive energy hog. That's just wasted energy to try to throttle back to establish a flow rate when we can change the speed to, to give us flow rates. A 20% improvement in efficiency is a quantum leap. I mean, you know, you're looking at, at we're, we're, we're reaching, the, we're reaching the, the limit of physics. You know, we're trying to tweak 1% or 2% energy efficiency savings out of a pump. And that's, we consider that, you know, a, a pretty good. I agree, there's room to go. Correct. Yeah, these were industrial type pumps, anywhere from 5, 10, up to 40 horsepower. So the big chassis mounted, wall mounted inverters were used to retrofit. There was one pool that there were three um, of the residential scale pumps retrofitted. It was a pool where rather than one big pump, they had three, three smaller, three horsepower pumps. So one did under, undergo that, but most of them, 21 of them of the 22 were all larger. It's available. We've turned it in through the, through the system, so they should have it. However you obtain the presentations through the conference, it'll be available through that. So yeah. uh, to scale, these are all fixed workers. Hmm? Do you think it's just the same principles that you use for applied to your backyard pool or even for like a farm? Sure. Well, so to give you some, some uh, sense of the magnitude, with 322,000 commercial pools, and, and based on their size, that represents eight power plants. If we look at the five and a half million residential pools, that accounts for about 24 power plants. Much smaller pools, but much many more of them. So, does that? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, it's beneficial, and and the the technology where it's being implemented is on the residential scale right now. There's de product development underway to take advantage of the Energy Star, because Energy Star is really limited up to five horse. Nothing above five horse is considered industrial equipment. It doesn't get Energy Star rating, although it will be subject to the, the Department of Energy's federal, federal requirement. So um, it, it absolutely does, does have an impact. Residential is huge. Did I have one more? I wanted to show this. This, this is just for, to finish on, on some laughter. So when I'm working with the utility company, um, they typically think of hot tubs, because you mentioned hot tubs, hot tubs and spas, and, and I have to you know, describe to them, we as an industry think of these things as distinctly different, a hot, portable hot tub versus a, an in-ground spa. And sometimes the best way to describe what something is, is to show them what it is not, okay? So this is an example of how I'm educating utilities on what is not a hot tub? So here's an in-ground spa, right? All right, that's not, not a hot tub, okay? <laughs> no, these are not hot tubs. <laughs> not, not a hot tub. <laughs> Not, not a hot tub. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> All right, there. Now we have a hot tub. So, in on a chuckle. Okay. <laughs>